Hello, uh, thank you for having me to the, the DAR generally as an institution, to uh, Sarah specifically for uh, organizing, et cetera, um, and to Kevin for managing tech, uh, which is often beyond me. So I appreciate that it's already just sorted. Um, I'm Daniel Graham, uh, as my intro indicated. So my big, the big questions that I am, am seeking to address through this presentation are, how did new technologically driven industries develop in the 18th and 19th centuries, which is typically an era in which uh, we do not think of new industries as being techn technological in, in the same way as later 19th century or 20th century industries, and how did technological advance impact consumerism in that same era? In addressing those questions, I aim to use rubber as a sort of illustrative case study for a lot of the dynamics that we see play out across a number of industries uh, in that same period. So the history of rubber itself is one that has a lot of gaps. Uh, when I began research for my dissertation on the, the same subject, uh, the majority of books say something to the effect that rubber, rubber has existed and been in use since uh, pre-Columbian times in, in South America, but really the story picks up with the advent of the automobile and the automobile revolution driving global demand for this product. However, I was reading uh, uh, King Leopold's Ghost by Adam Hochschild, and it mentions sort of in passing uh, early on in the book that in 1885, one of the motivating factors for King Leopold II of Belgium to want to colonize the Congo was that they had a significant source of rubber there and that that would surely be a, a high value commodity. Now in 1885, the automobile existed, but it existed as a sort of fanciful prototype um, pieced together by a, by a couple German engineers. It was not by any stretch of the imagination, a global industry, a significant source of income or value, a consumer good uh, in any way at that time. So how is it that rubber could possibly have been a globally significant high value commodity if the value of rubber is so closely tied to the automobile at that time? The answer rather simply is that the value of rubber was not tied to the automobile and that in fact, there was a thriving global rubber industry already well established by the 1880s, in fact, well established by the 1850s. Uh, a, a fantastic example of this is not only uh, the numbers of print advertisements, catalogs, storefronts selling rubber goods, but also at the, at the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition, this is a, a painting thereof, in the center of the United States gallery, in a very prominent position, is this strange sort of amorphous blob thing uh, standing about 14 feet tall. That strange blob-like thing is a rubberized pontoon boat, the, the latest in boating technology as of 1851. The fact that you could coat a heavy canvas fabric in rubber and create something that was entirely not only waterproof to prevent the infiltration of water while on the water, but also airtight in that it was itself inflatable that is from the, the, the point from which it gained its buoyancy was uh, truly remarkable to, to any number of uh, Crystal Palace visitors in the 1850s. The story, uh, actually, I wanted to do these out of order, but I messed up in how I put them there. So the questions then become, how does a successful global commercial industry develop from, from relatively obscure beginnings, which I'll get into in just a moment, and how does that connect to the early United States more specifically? The earliest European encounters with rubber are really in, in the earliest European records of the New World. Uh, writers like Bernardino de Sahagún in his Florentine Codex, um, Juan de Torquemada in uh, De Orbo Novo. Bo both of these fellows are uh, Franciscans who are accompanying Spanish expeditions to the New World. De Orbo Novo, of course, just meaning the New World, of, of the New World. Um, and they note in sort of larger, uh, generally kind of like ethnological uh, uh, 
explanations and, and descriptions of native groups, that there is this remarkable material that they acquire by cutting a tree. And when they, when they cut this tree, it seems to weep. And indeed, the earliest word for rubber was caoutchouc, which was a sort of Europeanized bastardization of the native words for weeping wood, uh, because it is from this tree sap that uh, has within it this hydrocarbon chain that is latex that you can, you can sort of refine rubber. Um, Europeans thought this was neat and curious, but didn't see particular use in it for quite a while. Uh, that is, of course, until in the 1750s, 1760s, uh, teams of largely French explorers, uh, generally speaking, not even there to investigate tropical commodities or rubber in particular. Um, Charles Marie de la Condamine was there to measure the distance between meridians as part of a uh, French scientific expedition. But upon encounter with native groups and recognizing this material that they were using to create things like waterproof shoes and waterproof cloaks, um, as well as, uh, you know, watertight vessels for, for carrying any number of things, was utterly fascinated, acquired a sample of this and sent it back to the uh, Academy of Sciences in Dijon. Thankfully, uh, all of the sort of provincial academies of science in France ultimately end up sending papers to the Academy Royale des Sciences, where those are then published and accessible for folks like me. Uh, but Charles de la Condamine, another French explorer and naturalist, Francois Freneau, uh, both noted that this was uh, not only something that was a tropical curiosity, as previously noted, but rather potentially an extremely useful product for any number of manufactured goods of European interest. The problem was, however, rubber uh, is fairly limited in its geography. Now, there are over 500 different species of plant that produce some level of latex. Most of those produce too little latex to be of any real use. Um, something like a dandelion. If you've ever ripped a dandelion stem and the, the sap of that feels a little sticky, that is latex um, or milkweed. If, if any of you grew up in rural Maryland, as I did, milkweed's probably a thing you're familiar with. And that also has a sort of sticky sap to it. Um, sidebar, in, in 1942, when the Japanese uh, invade the uh, Malaysian Peninsula, that cuts off the majority of global supply for rubber. And the United States and uh, Soviet Union uh, start and uh, Germany as well start investigating other alternative ways to acquire rubber. Um, Germany really focuses on synthetic rubber. Uh, the Soviet Union focuses on the possibility of cultivating huge swaths of dandelion to supply their rubber needs. Uh, doesn't really pan out. Uh, the U.S. really focuses in on on uh, guayul, which is a, a rubber kind of cousin substance that uh, is acquired from certain cacti, but also doesn't really pan out. Um, the most commercially significant source of rubber is the Havia brasiliensis tree, uh, which is first identified by um, another French botanist, Aublé. But uh, this tree is so significant because you can cut the bark subsequently over the course of several months, years, returning every week-ish, and, and get a steady supply of rubber without killing the plant. Uh, earlier significant plants, you had to either fell an entire tree uh, to get the rubber out, or um, in the case of the rubber supply in the Congo, it was vines largely, which again, you had to kill in order to uh, obtain the latex therefrom. Indigenous use is really focused on waterproof garments and really focused on creating those things at the source, which is to say, as soon as this sap comes out of a tree, you are using that to coat either a pre-made garment or in the case of overshoes to dip a foot into that and then allow it to dry out. And then through subsequent dippings and dryings to build up layers and, and a more significant shoe. The thing is that when exposed to the open air, the latex coagulates over time. And every attempt to transport liquid latex back to Europe for study resulted in either a solid useless block arriving, or in some cases, because it is organic, uh, it would rot, it would spoil on the way. And then um, you just have a big stinky mess that's of no real use either. However, samples of solid rubber were sent back to Europe for study in France and Britain primarily. And very early on, we see 
a, a international scientific network form. Ideas are being shared between folks in, in Italy, like Giovanni Fabroni, who uh, most of his work has to do with scientific agriculture. He corresponded with Thomas Jefferson quite a lot, actually, on agricultural topics. Um, people like Joseph McKay, who was uh, in, in one of the big names in the early history of chemistry. He wrote the uh, Dictionnaire de Chemistry, de Chimie, much rather, um, and, and later uh, the Elements of Chemistry, uh, which if you're in the history of chemistry, these are like foundational texts. Uh, and he was deeply involved in studying rubber through the French Academy of Sciences. Uh, a bit later, we get folks like Joseph, or sorry, James Syme, who was born in 1799, a Scottish physician who uh, discovered that naphtha, which can be derived from coal tar, was an effective solvent. Really, all of these thinkers were engaged in trying to find a way to reliquify solid rubber so that they could put it to the same uses that indigenous peoples did, but in Europe. Having identified turpentine, ether, and naphtha as effective solvents, this opened the, the door for, for uh, much greater commercial potential, which came primarily in the United Kingdom through Charles McIntosh and primarily in the United States through Edwin Chaffee. Charles McIntosh and his eponymous Macintosh rainware uh, were built around the discovery of James Syme. Originally, Macintosh was not actually interested in rubber manufacturing. He was interested in making a alternative crimson dye. Crimson dye made from lac beetles or, or cochineal uh, is very expensive. You need to get these very specific bugs uh, that only seem to exist in far flung reaches of empire, uh, grind them up into this brilliant crimson color. Macintosh discovered that uh, if you take this particular red lichen that grows in the highlands and throughout Scandinavia uh, and mix that with ammonia, you can make a pretty good knockoff for a lot less money. Originally, Macintosh based his entire ammonia supply on collecting the urine of his employees, but there are limits to how much ammonia one can access in that way. James Syme had published a paper in the Philosophical Transactions of Edinburgh uh, in which he described a process for deriving coal tar naphtha and as a byproduct of that process, ammonia. Macintosh formed a contract with the gas works in Edinburgh, which was responsible for all the gas lighting in the city. Um, gas lighting as in street lights, not as in you know, psychological manipulations. Um, I don't think they had an office for that. I hope not. Uh, but Really, his, his foray into rubber manufacturing was a business decision. How can I better use a byproduct of an existing business venture to make me more money? In reading this paper about naphtha being used to dissolve rubber, he launched into that field. Natural rubber is actually pretty unpleasant. It gets tacky and sticky in the heat. It gets brittle and cracks in the cold, and it smells kind of bad always. Macintosh's big innovation was if you take a layer of rubber and put it between two sheets of fabric, you never actually encounter the rubber core directly, only encountering this heavy canvas cloth, and that makes it a much more uh, uh, appealing consumer product. In 1823, he begins marketing his, his rainware. By 1830, he has shops established in dozens of major cities throughout the UK, as well as a couple contract uh, manufacturers in the United States. Edwin Chaffee opts for a mechanical means of manipulation. He builds a machine called a uh, calendar, which basically shreds and grinds and heats scraps of rubber into a pliable uh, sample that you can use to form things like the soles of shoes. Uh, Chaffee establishes his business in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Now, as demand begins to rise in these major manufacturing centers, Macintosh has based his whole operation in Manchester in the United Kingdom. Chaffee is based, as I said, in Roxbury, which is a, a um, suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. Supply begins to intensify. As, as mentioned in, uh, in Sarah's presentation, for one, there were a lot of connections between American material culture and consumerism and a larger Atlantic world and several systems of slavery. Uh, one that is less often emphasized in the context of US history is Europeans exploiting indigenous labor in South America. But that was the, the 
primary source of rubber for U.S. manufacturing needs. Uh, so this began as a system under the Portuguese and, and was not limited to, to rubber, but rather to a wide range of what were considered to be sort of um, wild commodities that uh, in their natural habitat grow in very far flung and difficult to access spaces. Uh, with regard to Havia brasiliensis itself, if you plant trees too close together, they all die because there's this uh, microcyclus fungus that infects all the leaves, which uh, Henry Ford would later find out he tried to build a rubber plantation in the Amazon and all the trees died and it went terribly for him. Uh, so as these trees naturally occur, they are spaced out several miles from one another. The system of extraction was that uh, Serengueros, who were indigenous uh, rubber tappers, would have a trail, a loop that they would run that hit upon several trees, and they would run this daily, collecting uh, as much rubber as they could, which they would then deliver to a patrol, who was a European merchant and usually creditor. So this was not a system of chattel slavery in the same way that it was in the U.S., but was rather a system of de facto slavery based on predatory credit and, and debt practice. Um, in, in much the same way that we see in, in, you know, later in like mining towns and people being paid in scrip and things like that. Um, so these uh, indigenous people would be in some way, usually through um, the imposition of European legal norms, be told that they had incurred debts that were, you know, pretty much non-existent actually. Uh, and that in order to pay off those debts, they needed to work for this European merchant and landowner. Oh, I purchased this land from some other European, not you. And now that because you live here, you owe me rent in the form of rubber. Um, and if you don't want me to take you to the law of this Portuguese colonial establishment, then you better just fall in line about that. Um, all of this wild havia that was uh, uh, harvested throughout the Amazon was then shipped down uh, different rivers within the Amazon network, largely to the cities of Pera and Manaus, where it was then shipped to the US and Europe. And like any number of other Atlantic cash crops, uh, we see records of importation in major ports like New York, like Philadelphia. Um, and, and it's at the same time that we recognize the development of industrialization in the United States and the United Kingdom, which, you know, sort of most, most often we'll look at something like the textile industry. That's actually the rubber industry is developing in the same places at the same time in tandem with the textile industry, because the majority of manufacturing practices employed in the rubber industry have to do with coating fabrics in rubber. If you want to build a hose, make that hose out of cotton webbing and then coat it in rubber. If you want to build a waterproof shoe or a waterproof coat, make that thing out of fabric and then coat it in rubber. So it's, it's not a coincidence, but rather an instance of technological convergence that those two industries were, were reliant upon one another in these different ways that they develop in those same places. Uh, but unlike the textile industry, the rubber industry is industrialized from its inception. Um, there were not, you know, the, 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 the cottage industry system uh, was already being eclipsed by the time rubber was, was of interest to American consumers. Greatest uh, advance in the history of rubber was the discovery of vulcanization. Vulcanization is a process by which a sample of rubber is combined with sulfur over heat and as a result thereof, becomes a much more stable substance. It stops smelling so bad. It is no longer as subject to temperature change. Uh, it also gains a lot more abrasion resistance, which another connection to industrialization, um, leather belting, le machine belting used for, for powering the machinery of industrialization, um, has some problems to it. It can stretch if it gets wet. Um, there's, there's a certain amount of laxity that can be introduced into those systems. Buffalo hide was more highly prized than cow hide for machine belting because it was much thicker, uh, which is also part of why in you know, westward expansion and manifest destiny, uh, buffalo hides were a valuable commodity in the first place. But if you just take enough rubberized fabric and layer it and layer it and layer it and laminate that whole thing, you can create 
a belt that has more abrasion resistance, that doesn't stretch when it gets wet, that has greater elasticity than any alternative product. And it's not just a moment of product substitution, but it's actually a moment of, of a superior competitor being introduced. That only works if that rubber is vulcanized. If the rubber is not vulcanized, then the heat and friction involved in being a machine belt, um, it melts. It, it becomes pretty useless pretty quickly. Uh, vulcanization is itself hotly contested by those two men who claim to have invented the process. Charles Goodyear, whose name we are likely familiar with from blimps, if little else, uh, the American, uh, based in Roxbury, Massachusetts, he had worked for Edwin Chaffee briefly, as well as a number of other upstart rubber manufacturers in the region. In 1839, he claims that he developed the process of vulcanization. Now, it took him five years to patent. And in that time, he was unable to recreate the process he claims to have discovered. Seemed a bit dubious. Thomas Hancock, the scientific mind most directly uh, connected to Macintosh's uh, business acumen in the Macintosh Corporation back in Manchester in the United Kingdom, beats Goodyear to the punch by about six weeks. He patents uh, late in 1843. Goodyear finally patents early in 44. Hancock, in describing his process of discovering how to sulfurize, that was the, he, he used the term sulfurize. Uh, Goodyear preferred the sort of homage to Roman mythology uh, with Vulcan and Vulcanize. Uh, not an homage to Star Wars or Star Trek. Oh my God. Uh, I know, I demerit to me, my apologies. Describes a, a friend of his, a man named William Brockton, presenting to him a sample of treated rubber that when investigated was subject to none of the uh, uh, mutability of raw rubber. And he noticed that it had to it a slightly yellow hue that he suspected to be sulfur and that this launched him on, on a, a series of investigations at the end of which he had created sulfurized rubber and patented that process in the United Kingdom. Goodyear claims that sample of treated rubber that was the point of inspiration for Hancock was his and that William Brockton had taken it without his knowledge and gone to the United Kingdom and was seeking, supposed to be seeking, as Goodyear's agent, uh, people who would be interested in uh, buying licenses to use Goodyear's patent just as soon as he got around to actually patenting it in the United Kingdom as well, which he was totally going to do any second. Now, don't you worry. Problem is, most of these accounts of the genesis of this brilliant idea come from, on the one hand, Goodyear's autobiography, which he wrote 15 years later, and Hancock's autobiography, which he wrote uh, about 13 years later. Both of those biographies were written at a moment in time when each of those men were deeply involved in a whole slew of litigation related to their patent and had a whole lot of ulterior motives for establishing the primacy of their invention and idea. And neither of them could seem to give a really great account of an original moment in which they saw this connection of sulfur to rubber. Hancock freely admitted that, no, it was, it was this other sample, but I patented first, so that's really what matters. And Goodyear said it just... It, uh, it, it, literally, he says, um, <laughs> uh, oftentimes providence gives to those who put forth the most effort moments of divine inspiration. He stops short of saying, uh, like, God himself guided me to this, but it's, you know, heavily implied, perhaps. Now, by complete coincidence, Goodyear happens to employ a man named Nathaniel Hayward. Nathaniel Hayward has an account in which he was trying to do something completely different. He was charged with making a series of waterproof aprons uh, that he wanted to be white. He was making them for butchers and butchers likes to wear white aprons. It has a lot to do with sort of how butchers marketed themselves. In fact, that if, if you could keep a pristine, clean white apron, that that must say something uh, very positive about your ability and acumen as a butcher. Now, the fact that that apron would then be 
waterproof and sort of impervious to absorbing anything. It's a little bit of a dupe. But uh, Hayward looked to another industry in which sulfur was used quite effectively to bleach, which is to say the production of woolens and straw hats in particular. Sulfur as a bleaching agent had been known in other areas of textile manufacture for hundreds of years. Now that, like Macintosh, used to be done through the application of urine and leaving things out in the sun. Uh, but as we enter a more uh, sort of chemically adept era, uh, was done with a synthetically derived ammonia. Hayward just thinks, I'm going to turn this apron white. But when returning to that apron, realizes that he has changed something fundamental in it. There's a paper trail in which Hayward presents this to his employer at the time, Charles Goodyear, and says, hey, look, I did a thing. And Goodyear goes, I don't think that's going to go anywhere. And then coincidentally, a couple of years later, patents something that looks an awful lot like a sulfurization process that uh, Hayward called it solarization because he thought that it was the exposure to the sun after bleaching that was the sort of key ingredient uh, in that process. Now, there is a lot of, of ongoing contestation. Uh, and, and there is also a possibility, admittedly, that um, there was some sort of uh, original genesis of this idea in two separate places. Uh, I would point to you know similar debates about like who developed calculus? Was it Newton or Leibniz? And I think there's a good argument to be made that they developed those things independently for independent reasons. Uh, this one seems a little less clear cut to me. Regardless of who first develops this patent, it becomes the defining feature of rubber manufacturing moving forward. All goods are going to be vulcanized um, because Unvulcanized rubber is just kind of nasty and not a thing that consumers are particularly interested in. Uh, and in fact, there are a number of failed business ventures related to unvulcanized rubber. Uh, Charles Goodyear secures a, a pretty uh, a high dollar contract with the United States Postal Service to produce waterproof mail bags, and he leaves them in a warehouse and they all melt. And when delivery date arrives, he has nothing. Uh, and it's bad for him. What we see, particularly in the American example in the 1850s, is a shift within the rubber industry away from small-scale firms, independent manufacturers, and towards proprietary control and intellectual property. And that's primarily because when Goodyear gets his patent, that patent is written very broadly. This is a trend that we see in a lot of instances when a fundamentally new industry um, is or a new invention is first patented. Uh, a very similar example is actually when, when the Wright brothers patented their invention for the airplane. Uh, the patent for them read any, any flying device in which the plane of a wing is manipulated in any way. Uh, and, and then any other device that had any kind of foil that shifted in any way, they would say, oh, that's an infringement of our patent. A modern patent would never be allowed to be that broad, but at the time, nobody understood the technology with which they were dealing. Similarly, uh, Goodyear's patent is, is any combination of sulfur and rubber. Um, none of the sort of is, is what, what kind of sulfurous compound is that? What is the actual process? What are the quantities involved? What is the time involved? What are the conditions under which this combination occurs? Not really important. Goodyear launches on a campaign of litigation against anyone and everyone who would ever possibly have anything to do with rubber. His goal is to control an industry. He thinks he's going to make a heck of a lot of money doing so. Unfortunately, he doesn't have capital to pay his lawyers to do all of the litigation and instead pays them in shares of his patent. He ends up dying in debtor's prison. Um, and people like Horace Day, who uh, represented him in a number of, of cases, uh, gets quite wealthy as a result thereof. Uh, one of those cases, in fact, was uh, the the opposition was argued by Daniel Webster um, in the Great Rubber Case, as it was called. Uh, but we see through the application of patents, a fundamental shift in the structure of the rubber manufacturing industry in the United States. And we begin to see for the first time, the amalgamation of 
small manufacturers into larger corporations in this industry. Uh, and we begin to see a number of other sort of legal strategies being deployed to mitigate risk, uh, largely legal risk. Over this time, the global significance of rubber um, climbs and climbs and climbs. Uh, the earliest numbers for which I could find uh, were from 1870 forward. But um, of course, all of this is, is Pro, or much of this, much rather, is, is prior to the uh, global significance of the automobile as a consumer good. And largely, this earlier manufacturing is based on the fact that rubber is waterproof, airtight. With the advent of the telegraph, the fact that it's electrically resistant becomes very uh, appealing and interesting. Now, as we move into the later 19th and 20th centuries, the strategic significance of rubber um, becomes a, a ongoing uh, motivation for, for colonialism, both in the Belgian Congo, but also in, in 1876, a British expat manages to smuggle havia seeds and seedlings out of Brazil, much to the chagrin of the Brazilian government. He transfers these to the Kew Royal Botanical Gardens in the UK, where uh, Joseph Hooker is at that time the, um, I forget his actual title, director of, of the Kew Royal Botanical Gardens. Uh, Hooker uh, has kind of a scattershot approach to this strategic possibility and sends seedlings to any colonial garden station that is at roughly the same latitudes as the Amazon, because there's a prevailing belief that that's how climate works at the time to say nothing of the fact that the, like the Sahara is roughly parallel to uh, the Amazon. But rubber happens to grow particularly well in uh, what was at the, that time the British colony of Ceylon, although they did not want to displace tea production there, and in what was the uh, Federated Malay States, which would be modern day Western Malaysia. In an area about the size of Delaware, 75% of the world's rubber production in 1900 was being produced. And that's simply because when the seedlings were transferred, that endemic fungus that would destroy rubber plantations in the Amazon did not come with it. Um, now, botanists at the time did not understand this. There was not an, an, an intentional quarantine imposed. It was just kind of dumb luck. Southeast Asia is still a major producer of natural rubber to this day that, as I mentioned earlier, became a, a, a strategic concern in 1942 when Japan invaded that region, uh, cutting off allied supply to that natural rubber. But when we think about the, the history of technology broadly, rubber illustrates a number of patterns that, that are largely present in a number of other industries as well. When a new idea, when a new technology is first introduced, people are very willing to share information about that thing. We see this play out in early aviation, in early computation, uh, early on with, with superconductors and semiconductors, uh, and early in the rubber industry, that there are these networks of, of, of letter writing between scientific thinkers, tinkerers, technologists, government officials across Europe, the United States, where they are exchanging ideas and information. I've just made this discovery and I think that that might be of use to you in your work. These things are being published in, not only in scientific journals like the, the memoirs of the Academy Royal de Sciences or in philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, but also in those kind of general interest arts and manufacturing journals that any well-heeled gentleman would, would avail themselves of uh, throughout the United States and Europe. These are ideas with which any number of people would be familiar. And the reason that people are so willing to share these ideas freely early on in the introduction of a new technology is because they don't see the profit in doing otherwise. If something is just a curiosity, just a scientific uh, possibility, sharing those ideas is fine. As soon as someone like Charles Goodyear 
sees the financial potential, there is then a different incentive to patent and control. Now, the unfortunate side effect of this is that proprietary control tends to slow down the rate of innovation. When people are freely sharing ideas, you get kind of a crowdsourcing effect. More people working on the same problem are going to produce more and more novel solutions to that problem. Um, and as people exchange ideas and build on that, benefits ensue. This is uh, some, some other historians have argued that this is true on a larger societal level that uh, when you look at sort of the, the, the rise and fall of empires generally, you can oftentimes pin the fall of an empire to the moment at which they said, we already have all the best ideas and no longer need to borrow ideas from other civilizations, um, which happens with uh, Chinese empires, happens with the Ottoman Empire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Another irony of this is that the person who patents is almost always integrally involved in that network of communication and innovation prior to the moment of patenting. Orville Wright wrote a letter in which he said, um, I can never imagine anyone controlling this kind of idea. It really should be freely available to everyone. And then six years later uh, was suing anyone who would dare. Uh, the, I, I don't think he appreciated the irony, but we certainly can with the uh, hindsight of history. This also illustrates a number of important things about the economy of the early American Republic. As pointed out in, in some ways in earlier presentations, this is a globalized and interconnected economy. Even, even from its inception, the United States is already globally interconnected. When you look at, um, at other works like uh, Marketplaces, Marketplace of Revolution by T.H. Breen, um, or uh, I'm blanking on the name of the, the book itself. Um, I digress. Uh, that, that both before and after the revolution, American consumers have access to goods from the Caribbean, goods from Europe, goods that are produced through the labor of African peoples and indigenous peoples. Um, the first treaty that, that, that the United States enters into following, uh, uh, you know, ending the war itself is the, the Jay Treaty, oddly negotiated by a Supreme Court justice, because who knows what they do that early in the game. But um, the, the Jay Treaty is, is, has, among other things, a number of trade provisions in it. Um, but what I find more particularly fascinating about the, this and these examples is that early American industry is scientifically driven. I think that we tend to think of industrialization in the 1830s as being primarily a, uh, a series of mechanical advances, which are not to say that there is not science involved in those things, but a non-scientist can take something apart and understand its workings and, and how to reproduce or recreate or rebuild the thing which they have taken apart if they have some level of, you know, general world knowledge and common sense about how physical elements interact with each other. The reproduction of chemical processes requires a different level and kind of theoretical knowledge, which we typically do not ascribe to industrialization in early America, but which was very present, not only in the rubber industry, but also in several areas of textile industry related to dyeing, related to how you treat different materials for any number of other things. And indeed, a lot of those practices go back into, in some cases, the 17th century, in some cases, even the 16th century. But they're not thought of as theoretical scientific knowledge. They're thought of as artisanal craft knowledge. What is perhaps unique in this era is that theoretical scientific thinkers are applying themselves to what was previously thought of as being outside the purview of theoretical science. Something related to manufacturing would be beneath the mind of, of the natural philosopher. It's for artisans to figure out. And yet, when you bring those two things together, the possibility for synergy is, is significant. Uh, and industrialization was, was not only the series of mechanical advances, but rather the mechanical advances and the chemical advances often played off of one another uh, to create not only new consumer goods, new ways of doing things, uh, but indeed an, an entire 
global industry. There is also, uh, I, I have some background in geography as well, so some element of spatial studies is, is frequently of interest to me. There's also a shift between, this is, this is a uh, fictionalized rendering based on his autobiography of Charles Goodyear making his discovery of uh, vulcanization in his kitchen. But the, the space in which these discoveries happen, you have a shift from the grand salons and, and institutionally supported venues of European scientific societies to the kitchens and garden workshops of American tinkerers. And then from there into the corporately funded, proprietarily controlled laboratories of manufacturing firms, um, which is, again, a, a pattern, a, a moment, a phenomenon that we tend to associate with late 19th century, early 20th century, typically in things like chemical industries, um, things like pharmaceuticals, uh, and, and research and development as a formalized codified system. But a, a form of de facto research and development is taking root in 1820, in some cases, even though the first corporately owned laboratory in the United States isn't open until uh, the 1870s. But uh, all of this to say that uh, through the case study of rubber, we can see not only these global interconnections within the American early American economy, but also the way in which our perception of industry and consumerism in the early American economy is actually much more, uh, in some ways, more modern uh, than we tend to give it credit for being. Uh, thank you all for your time and uh, kind attention. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I would love to field those. Yes, please. Do you have any idea of the uh, surviving objects of these? Because the literature museum is typically a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> these early mm -hmm. So, where are these early rubber overcoats or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of those various things that they're making out of rubber? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, am I aware of any uh, existing museum collections that have the earlier artifacts of rubber manufacturers? Uh, the short answer is not really. Um, many, many of the artifacts of which I'm aware are, are of the era that you've already alluded to, which is to say things like Bakelite, things like Ebonite, um, a lot of the objects that were exhibited in, in 1851, Charles Goodyear had a booth in 1851 where he was particularly proud of what he called ebonite, which was if you, if you cook the rubber long enough with sulfur, you get something that kind of resembles ebony. Uh, and he made a, a series of sort of relief sculptures and, and the cover of a book out of that um, and thought that he had discovered a, a brand new and amazing replacement material for this other sort of more difficult to obtain tropical uh, um, commodity. But um, I, I have seen photographs of some of these earlier overshoes, earlier um, rubber garments, but they're, they're really, they're scraps. It's if to, to an untrained eye, you would think, how are you calling that a shoe? Uh, but it's uh, largely through description in these 16th century sources that we, that we understand those things to have been shoes and, and coats and the process by which those were created. Um, sure. When you mentioned Ebonite, there was, a, I don't know how big it was, but there was a, an upsurge in creating other alternatives to money jewelry, to expensive things like jet. And Ebonite was one of the organized mm -hmm. rubber was the basis for all that. Yes, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the comment there was that uh, there was an uptick in uh, finding alternative materials for mourning jewelry, alternatives to more expensive materials like jet, and that Ebonite and, and a number of other kind of um, variants of vulcanized rubber were, were popular in that use. And actually a lot of, uh, un unrelated to that comment, but inspired by it in some way, uh, most of the plastics that we have now were failed attempts to create synthetic rubber. Um, and people went, well, that's not what I was aiming for, but might be useful for something. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. 
So the uh, advertisement in question uh, here. So this this is the, the original rubber store under Goodyear's patent established in 1839. Even, even in his advertising materials, he gives the date he claims for discovery, not the date he actually patented. Um, it's part of the whole marketing spiel. Um, so these these were uh, so if, if we if we judge by the number of products being created and the number of storefronts that are open, these were fairly popular um, consumer goods. But particularly prior to vulcanization, it's difficult to know to what extent because a lot of those did not survive. Unvulcanized rubber does not survive well. Um, and and uh, you know most of these materials are not sort of uh, high value enough to be individually noted in, in uh, you know, wills and, and uh, test date records. So, um, but, but, you know, we, we have records for uh, an order has been placed by, by such and such company for 1500 pairs of shoes um, in, in this particular year. Um, and, and we see that the, the amount of rubber being imported into these manufacturing centers goes from single digit tons into thousands of tons uh, between 1850 and 1870. Um, so there's there's good reason to think that this that these were fairly um, common consumer goods. Um, and and I mean, indeed, today rubber is is pretty ubiquitous, whether we realize it or not. I probably every one of us has some level of rubber in our shoe soles, um, any any number of elasticated anything's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you.